So if you will, turn with me to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, as we continue through this letter. This morning, I will be focusing on verses 10 and 11 of Titus chapter 1. Uh, the content over the next six verses is serious. Serious stuff. And it's a serious charge to overseers. So Titus 1, verses 10 and 11. I will read that, pray, and then I will begin. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Pray with me. Lord, we would ask now that you would open our eyes and our ears, that you would move our hearts to see your truth, to see the danger that is very real, a clear and present danger. Help us as a church to recognize the danger that looms. Help us as leaders to identify those who would falsely name the name of Christ who don't truly follow you. Holy Spirit, we ask you now that you would illuminate our thinking, illuminate our minds. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm sure most of us are familiar with the expression, a wolf in sheep's clothing. There was a 12th century rhetorician, that is somebody who deals in the art of rhetoric, persuasive speech or writing. This rhetorician, he wrote a work concerning that phrase, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And he titled it, You Can Get Into Trouble by Wearing a Disguise, and then gave an illustrative story. He wrote, A wolf once decided to change his nature by changing his appearance, and thus to get plenty to eat. So he put on a sheepskin and accompanied the flock to the pasture. The shepherd was fooled by the disguise, and when night fell, the shepherd shut up the wolf in the fold with the rest of the sheep, and as the fence was placed across the entrance, the sheepfold was securely closed off. But when the shepherd wanted his supper, a sheep for his meal, he picked the sheep, he took his knife, and unwittingly killed the wolf. His point? Evil doers will be found out and face a penalty. Comparably, a 15th century professor wrote this concerning a wolf in sheep's clothing. A wolf dressed in a sheepskin blended himself in with the flock of God, and every day he killed one of the sheep. When the shepherd noticed this was happening, he hanged the wolf from a very tall tree. The other shepherds asked him why he had hanged a sheep. And the shepherd answered, The skin is that of a sheep, but the activities were those of a wolf. This point, people should be judged by their works and not their outward demeanor. Now I want you to notice something. In both parables, the wolf was found out. But in both parables, the shepherd was fooled. That phrase, a wolf in sheep's clothing, originated in a sermon by our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 7, 15, and 16, where he said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. By their fruits you shall know them. Jesus' point Church, be on guard because evil imposters will infiltrate you. They will do it to devour you. 
yet you can identify them. You can identify them by examining their works. Now again, I'll remind you, Paul told the Ephesian elder, elders at Miletus this. He warned them and said, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Why? Well, he continues, because I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw, to draw disciples to themselves. Therefore, be on alert. Paul was certain that wolves would come into the church after he had left it. And those wolves would come from inside the church, not from outside the church. Again, from among you, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw you away. Paul was speaking of the wolves in sheep's clothing. Here in our passage in Titus, Paul is warning him of the very same thing. He wants Titus to be mindful on guard against the wolves that will surely arise in the Cretan churches. Again, as a recap, Titus is asked to go. He is tasked with this to go to all the churches on the island of Crete to appoint elders. And as we saw last time, they must be men who are above reproach. Men where scandal cannot be named against them, who will not bring scandal on the name of Jesus Christ. There are certain moral standards that they must not display. And there are other character qualities that they must exhibit. And we saw that in verses 7 and 8 last week. Yet, not only did Paul provide this list, it's this character qualities that an elder is to have, but Titus was told what an elder must do in verse 9 last week. The elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction to others and rebuke those who contradict it. The elder overseer is to teach sound doctrine, the word of God to the church, and he is to rebuke those who contradict it. Those who contradict the word are wolves in sheep's clothing. The wolf is to be identified. He is identified by his fruits, and he must be silenced. This is how the elder protects the church. This is what the overseers call to, appointed to, to guard the church. An elder, therefore, is the guardian. He is a guardian. He protects the church from spiritual harm, gospel dilution, doctrinal erosion, legalism, all that comes from a wolf in sheep's clothing. All those things come from the false teacher. This morning's passage, the main idea is this. Overseers must identify false teachers among the church and silence them before their teaching destroys the church. So with that, let's look at the first point. It's in verse 10. The false teacher's behavior. The false teacher's behavior. Again, verse 10 reads, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Now this word for here, this, this indicates that the, this is a purpose clause. It, it points back to verse 9, all right? It's a, it's a purpose clause. It gives the reason. In other words, Titus, an overseer, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, and he must be able to rebuke those who contradict it for the purpose of, for the reason of, 
that there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. That verse is, is intended to communicate alertness, awareness, beware. And honestly, it should alarm us. It should jolt us. Why should it jolt us? Because it says, for there are many, there are many wolves among the sheep. Not a few here and there, but many false prophets, many false teachers that are lurking to slaughter the sheep. So Paul continues by alerting Titus how he can identify the false teachers. Essentially, Titus, you can identify them by their behavior. That list that was given for the elder, the list that he cannot be beyond reproach and he cannot bring scandal, those character qualities are exhibited in false teachers. It's not a coincidence that Paul picks those to give to Titus because those are exactly the character qualities, the behaviors that a false teacher exhibits. So he says this, their behavior is insubordinate. That is, they were rebellious, ungovernable. They refused to be subject to any control. They are unruly. They disregard restraint. They are unwilling to submit. Utterly disorderly, and they are headstrong. They behave like their father, Satan. The original rebel. The original one who went his own way, who was insubordinate, who rebelled against God. False teachers are like the wayward teenager that refuses to submit to their parents' authority. They will not do what they are told. They go wayward and go after the things of their flesh. False teachers' behavior is that they're empty talkers. Empty talkers. They are fruitless, unprofitable, they are boasters, but with no payout. Jude and Peter say this about false teachers, that they are waterless clouds and waterless springs. That means they promise water, but they cannot produce it. He also says that they're fruitless trees in late autumn. They promise fruit, but because their roots are dead, they cannot produce fruit. William Shakespeare, in one of his plays, would have said it like this. He would have described false teachers by saying they are full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. They boast with great swelling words, but are empty windbags who cannot deliver what they boast. That is their behavior. He also tells Titus that they are deceivers. Literally means they're a mind deceiver or one who leads someone's mind into deception. They deliberately cause someone to believe something that is not true. They cause others to accept as true what is false. Unfortunately, these men have seldom difficulty gaining an audience. That's because in churches, they're often in positions of leadership. They're often teachers to the church, so they have no problem gaining influence. They have a voice, they have position, they have prestige. So Paul told Timothy something very similar. He said their behavior gives them away since they are evil men and imposters. They are proceeding from bad to worse, deceived and deceiving. 
and they pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. This is the false teacher's Bible. Like Satan, they use the truth and then they twist the truth and they reinterpret the truth. And ultimately, the false teacher will come to you and say, has God said the same trick Satan pulled on Adam? Their rebellious spirit, their empty boasts, their acts of trickery expose them for who they are. Paul adds this detail. He says, Titus, false teachers are especially those of the circumcision party. This is a clear reference to the Jews of the day, those who have been circumcised under the law of God. It is not a reference to Gentiles. Now we know from Acts chapter 2 that there were Jews living on the island of Crete. Many of them, though sympathetic to Jesus Christ, to the name of Christ, nevertheless they were what was called a Judaizer. They said you can have your Christ, but you must add this to Christ. They were Jewish men who attempted to place believers back under the law. Whether it was you must be circumcised or you must be ceremonially washed or you must eat only certain foods or keep Sabbaths or festivals, whatever the case, Judaizers would do this and sometimes even put them under rabbinical traditions. They sought to persuade men that they needed more than Christ and more than grace in order to be saved. We are told in Acts 15, Judaizer said this, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This was their message. They were the original legalists. Legalism was their standard. Legalism was their Bible. That's fine, but you must add, you must keep on. That is how you come before God. It's no wonder that Jesus engaged the Pharisees so often. Pharisees, men zealous for God. Men who said they were in the covenant of God. Yet were insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. So Christ engaged them. Actively engaged them. And he refuted them. Because they contradicted the truth. Christ, the true shepherd, daily silenced them. Daily engaged them. Daily called them out as imposters. Daily he would see their works and he would challenge them. Because Christ was the guardian of the truth. Christ was the great shepherd, is the great shepherd, sent to his people to care for his people well false teachers they will always distort the gospel of Christ always somewhere they will tweak it twist it reinterpret they will they will tweak the person of Christ he is not God or he is not man somehow they will deny the Lord and Savior they are steeped in legalism, the belief that behavior and works get you to God. It's what secures them. Effectively denying that salvation is holy of God and spreading the gangrene of their lives across the church. They accomplish this by denying the Spirit's inerrant word. Simply stated, they deny the scripture. They read the scripture and they see it as a means or a way for them to get their agenda in on you. They don't have the spirit of truth in them. They are devoid of the Holy Spirit. So as elders, we must pay careful attention 
to the flock. Close attention. That means we must know what you're reading and listening to and what you're being taught. That's why it's so important that as a church, as curriculum that takes place in our church, that elders are involved in that because we don't want error. We don't want the wolves to subtly come in and devour you. So let me give you just one way, one way as a church that we want to combat this problem. False teachers that come in, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. So our job as overseers is to identify not only who the false teachers are, who the wolves are, but we want to identify who the sheep are. That's where it starts. Who are the sheep? that belong to the fold. One of the easiest and most practical ways that we as overseers can identify sheep is through what's called meaningful membership. Meaningful membership. That is simply nothing more than asking a person, what is the gospel? See, we don't want to practice what's called member, immediate member assimilation, which is, which usually takes place when somebody comes by a letter of transfer, somebody walks the aisle, somebody makes a decision, and they are immediately assimilated into the congregation. There's problems with that. The first problem is this, if no one takes the time to inquire whether the prospective member understands and believes the gospel, whether or not it's meaningful, then we can't be confident that the people we are receiving in the membership actually follow Christ. We can't be confident of that. Furthermore, church membership communicates that the church believes that a person who is coming in to membership, the church believes that that one who comes in without inquiring about the profession of faith, not only could be giving them a false assurance, but it's damaging to our collective witness as a body. You see, as a body, we are responsible for who is in our church. We have a duty to those in our church. And so we want those who are here to be identified as sheep. So that's why we have to go through a membership class because we want to know, we want you to know what we teach, what we believe. And we want to know when we sit down and we talk to you, what you believe. Are you orthodox in your belief? Do you hold the sound doctrine? Because we want to protect the purity of the church. Not because we are making rules and making it hard again. But because Christ himself has said, as overseers, you are to guard the church. That is the motivation. That is what we do. This is our purpose when we have a members class and a members interview and ultimately congregational affirmation. We want to identify sheep. Well, let's look at the last point in verse 11. And it reads, they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Here I see this is the false teacher's motive. It's the false teacher's motive in this verse. Paul commands Titus to silence false teachers, that they must be silenced. That is, they must be muzzled. They must be gagged. They must be made to shut up. They must be silenced. Obviously now, this command is not something beyond something that says, all right, we should cause them physical harm, you should kill, kill them. Obviously that's not Paul's intent. 
his intent is this, that overseers, Titus, you must silence them. You must take away their voice. You must take away their platform that they can lead the church astray. Chiefly, this is done by elders holding firmly to the trustworthy word as taught. The wolves are identified. They are contradicted by sound doctrine. The word of God, that is our weapon. We contradict them by sound doctrine. We refute their lies and their claims because we have the truth. In all of its parts, all sufficiency, all authoritative, we have the infallible word of God. Paul is telling Titus that the, the overseer must refute their lies because they're upsetting whole families. Upsetting whole families. They are undermining, overturning, ruining whole families of faith. Not just people in the biological family, but those people that are in the faith, that are part of the congregation, that are part of the family. You must silence them, Titus, because this is what they're doing. They're causing them to stumble, to doubt, to question the Lord's word, thereby weakening them. Elsewhere, Paul says, these false teachers have shipwrecked someone's faith. The believer is like the ship and these false teachers come in and they undermine and they ruin everything and they wreck them. They get them off course and they weaken them and they cause them to doubt because they captivate the weak. This is what false teachers do. They, they are like the wolf who looks for the weak sheep the one that's easy prey. And they captivate the weak by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So Titus, gag their mouths. Don't let them speak. I remember being part of a church where there was a man in the church who had some influence and he was teaching that God is not triune in nature. That God is not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he had collected a small group of people, small gathering of sheep, and led them astray. That person shipwrecked the faith of those believers. That person was not identified in time before he did his harm. To this day, that church still feels the effects of a wolf in the midst. It is vital that overseers take the time to identify sheep and identify those false teachers. But what's the reason for the wolf's teaching. This is where I'm getting to with the motive. What is his motive? Why does he do what he does? Well, it says that he teaches for shameful gain what he ought not to teach. Paul is emphasizing this point. The false teacher's doctrine is motivated by his lust for money. The false teacher peddles his lies for shameful gain. This means he is shameless in his pursuit of wealth, money, luxury, life comforts. As we will see coming up, they are gluttons for wealth. They are drunkards for luxury. Jude says that they have abandoned themselves for the sake of gain. Just like Balaam's error. Now Balaam was this false prophet in the Old Testament. And the only way he would prophesy is if he was paid some silver and gold. And 
And so, like the false prophet Balaam, who could only prophesy for some money, likewise, false teachers on the island of Crete would only prophesy for money. Ty Titus, Cretans, false teachers are only prophets for profit. That is what Paul is saying. Cretan false teachers are only prophets for profit. After all, isn't money what motivated someone like Judas Iscariot? A false teacher? Someone who was a wolf in sheep's clothing? For even on the night that he betrayed our Lord, when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, none of them knew who it was. Wolves are not obvious. And yet Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, went out, betrayed the Lord of glory. I'd also add that don't suppose that false teachers are innocent victims. Don't suppose that they are unwitting pawns in a game and a scheme who do not know what they're teaching, who are victims of circumstance, victims of another, no, they are knowingly teaching what they ought not to teach. They are deceivers in the flesh. They are devoid of the spirit. They live a fleshly, natural lives. They are aware of what they are doing. They are going about deceiving on purpose. Even in our day, we have the types. We have the TBN types. I hope we are aware that that channel is purveyor of false teachers, TBN. Whether it's Benny Hinn or John Hagee or Creflo Dollar, that is where they lurk. The prosperity gospel fanatics. The prosperity gospel has come across the entire globe. It is sweeping the globe because it says God wants you to have riches, God wants you to have wealth. Major proponents of this, the Joel Olsteins of the world, those who would consciously and in an effort to take everything they can from you, to steal, to devour, to rob, to those who are just no name nobodies like the man that was in the church I was part of, all doing their work motivated by greed. Paul commands Titus to rebuke such men. He says, rebuke them with sound doctrine. They're motivated to teach their deceptions for filthy financial gain. They have greed in their hearts. They are trained in greed, is how one writer puts it. So how can we practically identify the wolves in a church? How can we know whether somebody is confused, weak in the faith, or someone who is deceiving, someone who is a false teacher? The scripture gives us the answer to this. Paul, he gives a discerning word to Timothy, Second Timothy, on how to identify wolves among the sheep. In dealing with the church family conflict, right? We're a family. We have conflict, just like normal families. And Paul says to Timothy, when dealing with church conflicts, this, he says, correct your opponents with gentleness. Why? God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, so that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Here you have sheep that are weak, that have been captured by the will of Satan. They unknowingly, unwittingly fall into the snare. And Paul says, 
perhaps God will give them repentance, leading them to their senses. There are people in our church that are captured by Satan to do his will. That is, they have been deceived, they have been led astray, they've been found in error. And Paul is saying that the key to determining if such a person is a sheep or a wolf can be revealed if they repent after being instructed and corrected. If they repent after knowing the truth. In other words, to the genuine believer, to the sheep, God will grant repentance to him in order for him to come to his senses and thereby escape the schemes of the devil. Repentance is for those who know Christ. Repentance comes from the spirit that dwells in every child of God. Yes, we get off track. Yes, we follow error. Yes, we can be deceived. But the overseer instructs and corrects. And the spirit through his word grants repentance so that they come out of the error. So they come to their senses. So they no longer are ignorant of the truth. But sadly, we know that not everybody will repent, will they? We know that in the church, there are examples after example of people who have been instructed, who are in error, and they will not repent. The key difference between an ensnared sheep and disguised wolves is that God grants his sheep repentance leading to the knowledge of truth. God grants his sheep that, whereas to the wolves, he does not. He does not grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. False teachers are willing participants in Satan's schemes. They are lovers of self. They are reproachable in their character. They are scandalous in deeds. As Paul says, they are always learning but never arriving at the knowledge of truth. They are never getting there. They're just bringing in knowledge, filling their heads, but they never arrive to the truth. Wolves are unteachable. They are insubordinate to pastors. They are purveyors of lies to the congregation, and they are always, always, always motivated by their flesh. They refuse to repent of their false doctrine because they are of their father, the devil, the father of lies. That is what a wolf is. That is what is being cautioned against and warned against in Titus. You must silence them. The one who will not turn from his sins and turn to serve God is a wolf. Let me say that again. The one who will not turn from his sins and will not turn and serve God even though he's part of a church, is a wolf. Paul warns, avoid such people. And here Titus says again, they must be silenced. Therefore, church, overseers must identify false teachers among the church to silence them before their teaching destroys the church. I'll finish with this. If you are someone who is confused, that group of sheep that is confused, unsure, untaught, undiscipled, someone who is easy prey, easy pickings, please, we want to help you. We want you to respond to that. We don't want you to be proud and that, arrogant and that, too proud to ask for help. That is not what we want. We want you to seek us out. We want to be able to help you. If you're someone who is in Satan's trap, that you know you're there, and you just don't know how to get out of it, pray to God that he grants you repentance. Ask him to give you repentance to come to your senses. If you are unsure where you're at, frankly, if what I've said sounds a little bit like you, 
in some way, I'm glad you're hearing it. I'm glad that you have heard. And there's still an opportunity to respond to the grace and mercy of our Lord. His mercy extends far. His grace will cover a multitude of sins. If you need to repent and believe, then do it. Call upon the name of the Lord, and He will save you. Don't wait. If you need help, seek us out. Pray with me.